Okay, so hello everybody again. So I hope anyone can uh, hear and maybe you can see me here. <laughs> okay, so um, yesterday I, I told you about the, the calculation and the meaning of the osmotic pressure of a polymer solution. So I just remind you of what I said yesterday at the end of my uh, first, uh, first course. So if you have here a, a recipient like this and uh, you, you choose to share, the, to share the recipient between two parts okay, of equal volume and in, in this volume you, you fill it with solvent okay, and you, you share the recipient by a, a membrane with a membrane with some uh, small pores, some holes in the membranes and this, these holes are small enough to prevent the, mole the um, polymer molecules to go through it, okay? But they are large enough to let the solvent molecule go from one recipient to the other, okay? So, as I told you yesterday, as a result, there is a difference of energy between the two, uh, the two recipients. And, of course, there is a pressure that is exerted by the, the, the polymer molecules, this pressure can be understood as a result of the Brownian motion of the polymer coils and at some points the polymer coils of course have shocks, I mean they, they, they make shocks against the membranes and these shocks are creating a force that acts on the membrane from the left to the right and this is what we call the osmotic pressure, this is this, this force divided by the surface of the membrane, okay? And as I told you also yesterday, there is another definition, so this is a, uh, just a mechanistic approach, just to give you what, what are the ingredients of this uh, physical, uh, uh, physical quantity. But the other definition is a thermodynamic definition of the uh, pressure, and here in that case, it is the uh, derivative of the um, Gibbs enthalpy of mixi mixing divided by the, uh, with respect to the volume of the recipient. And this is a derivative which is made at constant number of monomer and temperature, okay? So as I said yesterday, it is a result of what happens if I just display the membrane for a little distance inside here I compress the coils, so if, if the derivative of the volume is negative, it means that D of delta G will be positive. So as a result, this will be negative, and this is why we have a minus sign here to give a, a positive sign to the, to the pressure. Okay. So here, with this expression, we can use here, we can use the general expression that Flory derived for the... Uh, expression of the enthalpy of mixing, which is this one here, okay, that I showed you yesterday, that I explained to you yesterday what are the ingredients, okay? So if we take this expression and we derive it with respect to the volume, we can calculate the osmotic pressure. And if we do that by considering the limits where the volume fraction is small, it means if I have a small amount of coils, of polymer coils here, of polymer chains here, I can give a very simple expression of the osmotic pressure. The osmotic pressure reduces to that. So, okay, here is the thermal energy, the volume of one monomer, and you have two terms in this expression. Okay, so let's discuss these two terms. So first, if we have a very small value of the volume fraction, a very, very small for phi tending to zero, what happens is that these terms get much smaller than this one. And the expression of the osmotic pressure can reduce to uh, this. So I don't know if, if I can uh, just, okay, so I will write that here. Uh, no, uh, this is not a Taylor approximation. It's just that to get this, it's just uh, we, we, we 
when I when I do the derivative of the uh, un yeah. the Gibbs enthalpy of mixing, then I, I I I have some logarithm term. But if phi tends to zero, I can develop this logarithm term in terms of uh, power series, and I keep only the first term. Okay. So this is uh, right only at a very small volume fraction, okay? For phi, much smaller than one. So now, if I go back here, so if phi is very small, ooh, I'm not sure they will see <laughs> something. Okay. I'm just waiting for the camera to, okay, okay. So I hope uh, everyone can see that, okay. So this is the expression of the, of the pressure, okay. And in that term here, I am interested in this term, okay. Phi divided by N, phi is the volume fraction of polymer inside the solvent. Okay, so phi is equal to the total number of monomers that I have in the system, okay, times the volume of one monomer. So this is the volume occupied by the polymer chain, right? Mm -hmm. And this is to be divided by the total volume of the solution, okay? So if I put that into this expression here, I hope the people in Merida and other where can, can see that, okay? Then I end up with some very simple things, which is like KBT over V, okay? Times the number, the total number of monomer divided by the number of monomer per chain. Okay, so it means, so and this, okay, this quantity here is, I repeat, the total of num number of monomer in the system divided by the number of monomer per polymer chain. So in fact, you see, this is the number of polymer chain. This is equal to the number of polymer chains. Okay. So it means that this expression is equal to KBT times the number of polymer chains divided by the volume. And if you are familiar with the uh, pressure law on, uh, for the ideal, in the ideal gas approximation, you know that PV equal to NRT. So remind you of something. So this is the equivalent of the uh, perfect, the uh, ideal gas approximation for gas, okay? So it means that the pressure, so we can go back to the, to the, uh, oh, we can go back to the, uh, to the, to the slide. I'm sorry, it makes some, it is difficult for the people here. Okay, so, uh, here, if we go back here, it means that the first part here is equivalent to a perfect gas approximation, uh, to the ideal gas approximation. So it means that the pressure exerted by the, by the coils on, on the membrane here is just proportional to the number of objects, okay? And it can be described by the ideal, ideal gas approximation. Do you remember? what are the uh, approximations that we do when we use the ideal gas law? Do you remember that or not? What are the two approximations that we make when we use the ideal gas law? We have uh, particles are considered as infinity, infinitely small, so it means that they are considered uh, as punctual particles, okay? So it means, and they don't exactly, and they don't write one with another. So within the ideal gas approximation, this coil reduced to one point here. Okay, so it means that 
there is no volume attached to the, uh, the, 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 the molecules. And the other approximation is that the particles, I mean the, the polymer chains, do not see each other. They do not interact. Okay? So this is very, uh, how do you say that? This is very uh, pleasant to find out that we, we end up with this law when we are at very low polymer volume fraction. This is logical because whenever you have a gas, whatever gas you take, if you decrease the concentration of the molecule inside the, the recipient, you will always end up with a law like this because if you have very, very small amount of molecules, they don't see each other, okay? And the volume that they occupy in the, in the volume, in the is negligible. So this is something that is very, uh, 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 Flory was probably very happy to find that because it means that his approach is meaningful, okay? Physically acceptable, okay? So if we go back here now, okay, so this first term, we completely understand that, okay? Now let's increase a little bit the concentration. If we increase a little bit the concentration, then you will go to a point where this term will no longer be negligible with respect to this one, okay? This is logical if you increase it by this term. And you see that this term is ponderated by, is weighted by some factor here, which is 1 minus 2 chi, okay? So it means that the sign of this term depends on the sign of this, of this expression here, okay? So what's behind this term? First, we can feel what's behind this term by just thinking about one thing and reminding you of something I, I, I told you yesterday, okay? As I told you yesterday, if I consider uh, the recipient, which is full of monomer and solvent, as I again have the image that I used the other day, that saying that the monomers are balls and the uh, solvent molecules are balls of other color, okay? And if I say, okay, I have 10% of monomer in the solvent, then if I just take by chance one molecule inside, I have 10% of probability that I, I get a monomer, okay? Now, what is phi square? So phi is the probability of getting one monomer. So phi square is the probability of getting one monomer and another monomer just beside, okay? So if I just take with my hand two molecules inside the, the, the bag, the probability that I have to, to have two monomers at the, at the very close position is equal to phi square. Okay? So it means that this is the probability of contact of, the mono, of one monomer with another monomer. Okay? And this term, so this term is, means that this takes is into account the interactions between the monomer. We just saw that this term considers that there are no interactions between the monomers. But of course, as soon as I increase the polymer concentration, if I put more, more polymer chains in the, in the recipient here, of course, you can really see that this, this will be taking more and more spaces, and you will no longer be able to neglect the interaction between the, the polymer chains, okay? So this is not surprising that some phi square terms appear when I increase the concentration. So now, looking at the sign, at the sign of this parameter here, okay? What is the sign of this parameter? So you see that the sign of this parameter will depend on the value of chi again. Chi is the same as yesterday. It is the Flory parameter, okay? And you see that if 1 minus 2 chi is positive, it means that chi is less than 1 half, okay? Then this will be positive, okay? So it means that the pressure, 
the osmotic pressure, if k is, is less than one half, it means that the osmotic pressure will be larger than the ideal gas value. Okay? Because it means that this will add some supplementary contribution. So it means that the interaction between the polymer chains leads to an increase in the concentration, uh, in, 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 in an increase in the osmotic pressure. Okay? So let's think about that. You see, imagine that all these chains are moving, okay? If you say, consider the collision between the molecules, and I measure the pressure here. To your opinion, if the, the, the collision between the molecule leads to an increase in the pressure that acts on the membrane, does that mean that there is an attraction between the polymer chains or a repulsion between the polymer chains? A repulsion, of course, because if the are repulsion, it means try to avoid the other people here, the other chain here, and they will try to explore as much volume as possible to, to avoid the presence of the other chains, okay? So it means that the small value of chi, I mean chi smaller than one half, means that that induces repulsion between the monomers. Repulsion between the, the chains and repulsion between the monomers, okay? So if chi is less than one half, we have repulsion between the monomer. And if we have repulsion between the monomer, I ask you another question. If I take some polymer and put it in the solvent, if I have some repulsion between the monomers, to your opinion, will it help to dissolve the solvent? Or, or, or on the contrary, will it, will it uh, lead to an aggregation of the polymer molecule inside the solvent? If you have repulsion between the monomers, it should help the dissolution of the solvent, of the polymer inside the solvent, right? Yeah. Because the chains, they no longer want to be collapse one with another. They want to, to have contact with the solvent, okay? Because they repel each other. Is that clear for everybody? Yeah? Okay. So that's why we say that when we have a value of chi that is smaller than one half, this is what we call the good solvent condition. It means that the polymer will be fully miscible with the solvent, okay? And we will be able to compare that to what, to the result we had yesterday with the value of chi, okay? Now, let's go now on the other, on the other side. What happens if this parameter now is larger than one half? If this parameter is larger than one half, it means that this prefactor here is negative, okay? So it means that the interaction are leading to a, an osmotic pressure which is smaller than the ideal gas one. So it means that the interaction leads to a reduction of the number of collision of the, mole of the chains with the membranes. So it means that there are some attractions between the chains. Is that clear? Is that right for everybody? Okay. So it means that if chi is larger than one half, we have attraction between the monomers. Of course, if you try to dissolve a polymer inside the solvent, and if you have attraction between the monomers, okay, this is not a good situation to dissolve the polymer. Okay. The result is that you will not be able to dissolve the polymer. Okay. And this is why we count this as, we code this as the bad solvent situation, okay? And I will go back to here, but it means that over one half, you, you feel that you will have some phase separation problems because you have an attraction between the monomers of the chain, so they want to stick together, okay? 
Now, there is a very specific situation. A very specific situation is when I have this term, chi, equal to one half. Chi equal to one half is a situation where this term is equal to zero. Okay? So it means that whatever the concentration of polymer chain that I put inside the recipient, I always end up with some, I, in, within, I always remain, remain within the ideal gas approximation, okay? So it means that everything happens as if the chains do not interact one with another, okay? And this is what we call the ideal solvent situation, okay? The ideal solvent regime as a reference to the ideal gas approximation, okay? And this is something that will happen when you have a value of the Flory parameter which is equal to one half, okay? So if you look at that now, for small values of the Flory parameter, we are in the good, what we call the good solvent regime. For large values of the chi parameter, we are in what we call the bad solvent regime, okay? And for chi equal to one half, we are in what we call the ideal, ideal solvent regime, okay? So now, if you please uh, keep that in mind, we can go back to my, my uh, previous transparencies where I, I, I put that on the... Do you remember that? I told you the other day that above some given value of the Flory parameter, we had some phase separation occurring. Do you remember that? With the curve that was... There was a bump in the curve and phase separation and so on. Okay? So what you see here is that indeed for small value of the Flory parameter, we are in this domain here, okay? For a large value of the chi parameter, we are in this domain here where we do have a phase separation, okay? And the only subtleties, the subtlety is a different, is a, is a limit between these two regimes. Yesterday we found out that this limit was given by this expression of the Flory parameter. Okay, the critical Flory parameter. But if you look at that now, it means that one half is a limit value that we obtain when we have infinitely long chains. Okay, when we have infinitely long chains, this critical uh, Flory parameter will decrease and will reach a value of one half. Okay, so if I can write here again, Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so if I can write it here, I, I can just make a, a kind of summary of what we found, okay? So we have here the value, I, I plot the value of the Flory parameter, okay, as a function of the polymer volume fraction, right? Okay, and what we just found is a limit here that we call where phi is equal to one half, okay, and here we have a limit where we have what we call the ideal solvent. Above this value, we have the value that we found yesterday for chi c, Okay, and here we find out that above, above this value of chi c, we have the phase separation occurring, okay? The two phase domain, two phases domain, domain, okay? And what we just found here is that we have the good solvent
four values of chi that are less than one half and bad solvent above one half. So there is some kind, so everything is compatible except that we, we see that we have a small domain here in which we are in a bad solvent condition, so it means that the monomer at attracted one to another, but still there is only one phase. Okay, we have no phase separation. So what's happening? What's happening is that here, okay, the monomer are attracted one to another, but entropy and thermal shaking of the molecule is enough to uh, uh, counter, uh, I mean, to, uh, to, to oppose to this uh, attraction, okay, to be opposed to this attraction. So it means that in this region here, okay, the monomer are attracted one to another, but still they are able to dissolve because of entropy, okay? But then if we increase chi C over this value, we go to the, uh, to the, uh, bad sol to the uh, phase separation. And also you have one, th one thing that you see, is that if you increase the molecular weight of the chains, if you work with larger and larger chains, with longer and longer chains, what happens is that chi C here is decreasing. So this small domain is decreasing, okay? And if you, in the limit where you have infinitely long chain, okay, okay I know it's not a, an experimental situation that you will encounter, but you, you can have situation where you have very, very long chains, and this will tend to decrease like this and will tend to this line here, okay? So if we go back to the situation that we had the other day. I just wait for the adjustment to appear on the, on the board. If you go back to the, uh, what we said yesterday, I showed you these very nice curves, okay? So what happened that, do you remember yesterday I told you the Flory parameter is inversely proportional to the temperature in that type of uh, apolar systems, okay? So what's happening here is that chi C is inversely proportional to TC, okay? And when, when uh, the molecular weight is increasing, I told you that chi C is decreasing, okay? And because these two lengths are, in these two uh, parameters are inversely proportional one to another, so it means that when chi C is decreasing, TC is increasing, okay? And when chi C tends, I mean, when, when the molecular weight is increasing very much, for example, in this, that chi C will tend one half. So the temperature here where you have chi C tends to one half will tend to what we call the ideal solvent temperature, which is what we call the theta temperature. The definition of the theta temperature is the temperature at which everything happens as if the chains had no interaction one with another, okay? And this is a temperature where chi, the Flory parameter, is equal to one half, okay? Do you understand? It's a bit, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit complicated, but uh, anyway. So why do I want to tell you that? I want to tell you that because in the polymer handbook that you will find in libraries and things like that, you will not find any value of the critical temperature. So if you try to make mixture of polymer and solvent, it might not help you very much, okay? Because you cannot find the critical temperature. What you can find in the handbook parameter, in the uh, handbook of polymer, is the value of the theta temperature. So for example, for Polystyrene cyclohexane, we know that the theta temperature is above 60 degrees, somewhere like this, because 
the, the, the Tc is tending to theta when the molecular weight is increasing. And here, for example, in the polymer handbook, you will find that the uh, theta temperature is about uh, 60, uh, 70 degrees for polystyrene in cyclohexane. Okay? And this theta temperature is a function, of course, of the polymer and of the solvent. But this theta temperature is independent of the molecular weight of the chain. Okay? So this is why this is the quantity that they put in the polymer handbook because they want to have a quantity that is universal for a family of polymer in one particular solvent. You get the, my point? Okay. So we have now uh, defined what is uh, theta temperature. And now we can see if, how do we know that we have a good solvent or a bad solvent? Now you can make some measurements of the osmotic pressure as a function of the polymer concentration inside the solution, okay? And this is what I will show you now. These are experimental results, okay? So here, this is some experiments that have, uh, which have been performed with PMMA. I don't know if you're familiar with the polymethyl metacrylate. It's a Solve a polymer that can be dissolved in a various solvent, like for example acetonitrile, acetone, toluene. Okay, and this is what the author did here. They plot. Okay, so be careful to one thing. Here they plot pi divided by the concentration of polymer in the solvent as a function of the concentration of polymer inside the solvent. Okay. And you see that we, we can see two different behaviors. First behavior here, pi over divided by the concentration does not depend on the concentration. Okay? So what does that mean? So uh, I'm afraid I will have to <laughs> ask you to uh, go back to the board. Uh, let me just like this. Okay, let me just here I write pi divided by phi, okay, which is the equivalent of pi divided by c because the concentration and the uh, volume fraction are just, I mean, quantities which are just proportional one to another, okay? It's the same, in fact, okay? It's almost the same. So pi divided by phi, if I believe the, uh, the result that I found by dividing the, uh, by deriving the enthalpy and so on with respect to the volume, now you see it's kT, kBT, divided by A cube, and now I've got here 1 over N plus 1 minus 2 chi times phi, okay? You see, I have divided everything by phi here, okay? So, I hope it's clear for the people in uh, Merida and the uh, Okay, so now if we can go back to the slide, please. Okay, so just here, what I wrote on the board is just, I took this expression, okay, and I divided everything by phi, okay? Now, if I have something constant here, if I find that pi over c pi divided by c is constant here. It means that the second term, this one here, the terms that spells as 1 minus 2 chi times phi is equal to 0. Okay? So it means that if I have a behavior, if pi divided by c does not vary with c, it means that 
I am in a situation where chi is equal to one half. Okay? So these measurements here that gives you a constant value of pi divided by the concentration means that I am in the ideal solvent condition. Okay? Whereas here, if pi divided by C increases as a function of C, it means that the second term here is positive. Okay? And it means that if this second term is positive, it means that I am in a good solvent condition. So this is what is shown by this experiment is that when the uh, when I di dissolve PMMA in toluene or in acetone at the, at the temperature of the experiment, I know that these two solvents are good solvents of PMMA, whereas acetonitrile at this temperature is an ideal solvent for PMMA. Okay? Sorry? Uh, we, yes. Um, in a bad solvent situation. Yeah. In a bad solvent situation, we expect that it would go like this. Okay. But then, but then, he, he, in fact, he, it's very difficult to make that kind of measurements because if it's decreasing, then the, the pressure is too small to be measured. You have a phase separation in the system. It's very difficult to, to see this type of uh, condition. Okay? But yes, in principle, you're right. We should see a decrease here. OK? So this is, uh, so now you, you see everything is, uh, in fact, uh, what is interesting is that we see that everything is compatible one to, to another. We have an agreement because between what we did uh, yesterday and what we do today, fortunately. <laughs> but this is within the same theory, okay? And we, we keep the same approximation. But you see that one very good proof that the theory is meaningful is that we find some results like that, okay? If we find that here we have an osmotic pressure that goes like uh, uh, an ideal gas law, I mean, this is something that is very well established, so we know that it is something that experimentally is proven, okay? So, uh, uh, this is how we can... Uh, okay, so, just a summary then on polymer solvent interaction. So, you will find that if you have the par flow rate parameter which is less than one half, then you are sure that your polymer will be soluble in, uh, in, uh, in the solvent, fully soluble in the solvent, whatever its concentration, okay? Now, if you, if you are at a temperature where chi is larger than one half, then you are in a bad solvent regime, and you can start to have some phase separation problem. If you are one half, you can still have a one phase region. I'll show you that. If you are uh, now well above uh, one half, then you have phase separation, okay? And if you are at chi equal to one half, then you are in the ideal solvent condition, okay? Be careful, ideal, I don't know what it, uh, what it means in Spanish, if you say idealo or whatever, I mean, how do you say ideal in Spanish? Ideal. Ideal, okay. And in France, uh, the students uh, tell me, okay, so it's very good to have an ideal solvent because ideal in France, it means very good, very nice, okay? But it, it is nothing of that type in, the, in this uh, ideal because in, in, uh, in English, in fact, ideal means the fact that uh, it's just like in the ideal gas approximation, you see? So it doesn't mean that the solvent is a, is a good solvent for the polymer. It means that it is the condition where there are no interaction between the chain. And uh, theoretically, for people who make uh, models and so on, it's very convenient to work in this type of condition because you don't have to take the interactions into account, even at large concentration. So it helps very much for the people who do the calculation, okay? But we don't really 
We will not go into that type of details in this uh, course. It's too complicated. I want to remain close to the experimental uh, results. Okay. So, okay. So now we have a general general scope for the polymer uh, solution in into uh, the, the the dissolution of a polymer in a solvent. And now I want to go back to another thing: is that what is the conformation? of a polymer chain, okay, a polymer chain, I told you, we can see that as a, a kind of uh, a wire, okay, and we put that in the solvent. And one question that we may ask is, what is the size of this wire? How does this wire behave in the solvent? Is it something that is completely stretched like this, or does it make a kind of coil, a very collapsed coil, or does it take some solvent inside? What the, how does the molecule behave in solution? And also, I remind you what I, I told you in the introduction. Why, for example, are uh, polymer solutions very viscous at high concentration? Can we find some explanation for that? <coughs> and you see this guy, this man. You know this man? You've heard of this man. He's a French a physicist. So he is a kind of a very, he's very famous in France because he won the Nobel Prize, and there are not so many French Nobel Prize <laughs> in physics. So everybody was very proud when he got this Nobel Prize. But he is dead now, unfortunately. And this uh, man is a very uh, clever physicist. I don't know, you heard his name before? No? No? So he's a Pierre Gilles de Gênes. He's very famous because he's the one who tried to uh, find some very uh, simple laws to explain the behavior, for example, of polymers in solutions by uh, doing what we call uh, scaling laws. What are scaling laws? Okay. So he is a father of uh, scaling laws in polymer physics, and he wrote a very famous book on uh, polymer physics, which is called Scaling Concepts in Polymer Physics. So I want to tell you a little bit of that. Okay. And the question that he asked was, um, if you take a chain of polymer inside a solution, okay, what is the shape of this polymer coil in the of this polymer chain in the in the solvent? Okay, so you may think of several solutions. You may think, okay, maybe the chain will be completely stretched, like if I take a wire and I take it by the two. Uh, two two hands of the of the wire and I stretch it. I, I, will it be like this, or will it be completely collapsed together? Of course, you can feel that the this will depend on the interaction between the monomer, and this will also depend on another thing, which is, of course, the entropy of the system. Because, for example, if you take a can you imagine that the chain will remain completely stretched like this? Of course, this will not happen. Why? Because every monomer receives some thermal energy from the temperature. So every monomer he wants to move and he wants to explore as many conformations as possible. So you see, there is once again a very subtle equilibrium between the interaction between the monomers and the entropy the thermal shaking, thermal uh, energy that every monomer receives and that he wants to spend by exploring different conformations. For example, if I take the case where the polymer is in a good solvent, okay, it means that the monomer do repel each other very strongly. Okay? So if you forget about the entropy, if you just Forget about the fact that every monomer receives some thermal energy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you say, what is the best conformation? Then, if you say that there is a repulsion between the monomers, of course, the, the best conformation will be when the chains are completely situation. Work, yeah, yeah. This is a situation where the uh, monomer will be far away from each other, further away from one, one from another, okay? But then, so then if you have that, it means that the length of the chain will be just 
the number of monomers multiplied by the length of one monomer. Okay? But then you think, okay, but it's not possible because every monomer is moving and the chain will be exploring different conformation. And this is what happens. And what happens is that the equilibrium situation depends on the quality of the solvent. And in many cases, uh, I mean, and in, uh, in fact, you, the, the polymer will be organized as what in what we call a statistic coil. It means the polymer will have the shape of a sphere, okay, and this polymer chain will be, on average, confined into this space that I wrote here, this, this uh, space that I wrote as a dashed line here, which what we call a, a, sphere, or a, a sphere of gyration, okay? So it means that, on average, the polymer chain is contained inside this chain, in, inside this domain here. And this domain has a characteristic radius, I mean, as a size here, and this size is what we call the gyration radius of the polymer chain. All right? And what Pierre-Gilles de Gênes was asking is that, can we have an idea of the size of a polymer chain and can we, for example, predict how will the size of the polymer chain increase, of the polymer coil, sorry, how, how will the size of this, sphere of, of this sphere of gyration will increase as a function of the length of this wire here, okay? And this is what is behind the scaling laws. A scaling law is just a relation that you establish between a quantity, one quantity and another quantity, okay? And so, of course, as, as you, you see that, of course, the value of Rg will depend on the polymer solvent interaction and, I mean, when I say the polymer solvent interaction, I mean also the polymer-polymer interaction in the solvent, okay? As I just told you, if the solvent, if the polymer polymer interaction is repulsive, it means that the chain will be will take as much place as possible to avoid the, the, the contact between the monomer. Okay. And as I told you also, the Rg value will also depend on temperature because of the entropy and what I told you just before that the, every monomer is subjected to thermal uh, shaking and it wants to explore <coughs> as much conformation as possible, okay? So the size of this subject is a subtle balance, reflects the balance between these two antagonist effects, okay? And the question that we asked is, can we find a law to explain why uh, how does the uh, gyration radius vary as a function of the number of monomer here, Rg, as a function of n, okay? So here is, here are the experimental results. If you take, for example, polystyrene into cyclohexane, okay, at 35 degrees, if you look at the polymer undo book and you see, uh, you look at the ideal solvent of polystyrene, you will find out that experimentally it was proven that cyclohexane is an ideal solvent for polystyrene at the temperature of 35 degrees C. Okay? This is uh, an experimental fact. And if you measure, this is what has been done here, this is here is plotted the value of the gyration radius as a function of the molecular weight of the chain. So it means as a function of the length of the chain. And here you see that the gyration radius varies as the square root of the molecular weight. Okay? So I write here on the... Can you uh, switch to the, to the board here? And I, I'll try to explain to you very uh, simply why do we have a, a value like this. So we say Rg, the gyration radius, that 
it is possible to measure it with uh, neutron scattering. Well, this is complicated, but uh, let's just admit the fact that we measure it, okay? <laughs> so Rg is some constant I call, for example, k, okay, this is just a constant, times the number of monomer power one half, okay? This is exactly the same as what I wrote it here. The number of monomer is proportional to the molecular weight. So this is the same to write that. This is what I know from the experimental result, okay? So now, can I understand that, okay? And this is in the ideal case situation, so it means that this is when, in situation where chi is equal to one half. So how can I understand that? So I want to know what is the characteristic size of a chain that is in a, an ideal solvent, okay? So, for example, I take a chain, okay, and I say, okay, my chain has n monomers, so I, I draw my chain like this, and what I want to know approximately is what is the size here? What is the size here, okay? So I want to know the value of this size that I call R the R not null, okay, R zero. And for this, okay, I can just make a very uh, simple explanation. Okay, why, what is, uh, how can I guess the distance that will be between these two points, okay? Remember that we are in the ideal solvent situation, so it means that there are no interactions between the, the monomers, okay? So the situation is exactly equivalent as the one that would happen if I am. The situation is just like that. I am in a room, okay? And someone tells me, okay, you have to, to make 100 steps in the room. Okay, and every time you make one step, you completely forget where you were before. You can go anywhere in this direction, in this direction, in this direction, etc. Okay, so I do some kind of uh, completely random walk like this. I can go like this. I can go like this, and I can even walk on a, a place where I was before. Okay, and this is exactly the same situation of what I'm looking for here. Okay. Because the, the monomer will do B, uh, n steps, okay? And I want to know the average distance that I have, uh, I have uh, walked at the end when I, when I have made my 100 steps, for example, I finish here, okay? And I measure the distance from my uh, uh, zero point to here, and I do another one, and I, and I make the average of all this, okay? And if I do that, okay? This is very easy. I can, I can compute that very easily. I just do like this, okay? I say, once again, I say that the space is divided in little, just like on a chess table, okay? Like this. And every step is a small vector, okay? For example, this is my departure point, okay? Yeah. And then I say, okay, I make one step here, and then from here I can do another step anywhere on the chess table, okay? So I do like this, like this, and then for example, I go back here, and then I go back here, and then I go back here, I go back here, puff, 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 I do my, uh, big N, I do N steps, okay, N steps, and I want to know the distance between this point and this final point here, okay, I want to know this distance here, I call R0, this average distance, okay, so I just say, okay, every single vector here is a with an index here that I call A1, A2, etc., and AN here, okay? 
and I just say, okay, these are vector of, of length a, which is the size of a monomer, and I write that R0 is just equal to the, su the sum of i equal 1 to i equal n of a i. Okay? Very simple. And I want to know the average norm of this vector. So I do a very simple thing. I do the scalar of R0 times R0, and I want to know the average value of that, okay? Which is the average value of the square of the norm of R0, okay? And this is equal, this is equal to Okay. Don't worry. It will. I, I will not go <laughs> further than that. This is the um, most complicated thing that I will write on the board. Okay. So let's just think of this. The scalar ratio, the average of the scalar ratio of a i times a g. Okay. So, for example, I say. This is A1. I want to know the average value of the value of, for example, the product A1 times A2, the scalar product of A1 times A2. Okay? If A1 is like this, okay, A2 can be like this, parallel to it. Okay? In that case, what is the scalar product of two collinear vectors? A squared. A square. So in that case, it would be A square. Okay. Other possibility is that the A2 vector is like this. In that case, the result is minus A square. Okay. Minus A square here. Okay. Now, if the scalar vector is like this, you have it's going to be zero every time that the vector will be perpendicular one to another. So whatever network I use for that, I will always find zero when it will be perpendicular. And if I have one situation where it is like this, I will always have the symmetric situation where the, the, uh, the scalar opposite one. Yeah. You understand what I mean? It means that when I make all the sum of the different possibilities, for every a square, I have a minus a square. For every zero, of course, they contribute to zero as an as a average. So it means that the average of this will be zero. Okay? So all the uh, average of a i scalar product a j will be equal to zero except in one situation is when i is equal to j. Because if I take the average of a1 scalar a1, yeah. it is always equal to a square. So in this, in this product here, only the i equal to j terms are contributing. All the other ones are equal to zero. You get my point? Okay. So it means that in this sum here, you only have the a1 times a1 plus a2 times a2 and all the other one, a1 times a3, zero. a1 times a2, zero. Okay. And you have only a1 square plus a2 square plus a3 square, etc., etc. So you end up with r0 square, r0 square equal to a uh, n a square. Okay? So r0, average of r0 is equal to 
a times n to the power one half. So it means that the size, this this length here, r zero, okay. The average value of this r zero is equal to a n to the power one half. Okay, so it means that the average size of this of this chain here, on average, is a times n to the power one half. So if you now think of the gyration radius, okay, this is not the same length, but this is the length here. This R G is proportional to this length here. So it means that this R G will also be proportional to n to the power one half. Okay, so we have a very, I mean, this is a, this is a very, uh, very common uh, result. So can you please switch? So I hope you, you understood my point. It's, it's not a problem if you don't do the calculation. It's just just a question of understanding the things. Okay, no, nothing really. Uh, and this is what we observe experimentally. We observe that in that case, indeed, the gyration radius is varying as the square root of the molecular weight, which is exactly the, the result that we found out. Okay, so this is in the case of the ideal solvent. Now let's go to the case where it's a different case where we have the monomer that do repel each other. So just an intuition, I, I assume the intuition. To your opinion, do you think that the coil will be bigger when I introduce some repulsion between the monomer or it will be smaller? Bigger. It will be bigger, of course, because the monomers are repelling one, one each other, okay? So the coil will be bigger, and this is indeed what they found here, you see. This is the same polymer, uh, polystyrene. This is, you see, for example, here is the ideal solvent case. Here is the good solvent case. So you see that the chains are larger. And on top of this, the chains are larger. And also the law of variation of the gyration radius with the molecular weight is larger. Okay, the, the exponent here is larger, is 0.6 in that case, and it is 0.5 in this case here. So we see that the, the dependence is larger. Unfortunately, this is very, this result is much harder to find. Why? Because I cannot use the same thing. Okay, you remember my story of, uh, of walking on the, on the on the ground here so the situation here now is i am here okay and someone tells me okay olivier you have to do 100 steps into the room but then the difference with what with before is that every time i make one steps i draw a red line here and you cannot go back here because there is someone here and you have you have a repulsive interaction with this with this red line okay so i do like this and now you see it's, it is not easy at all to measure the average value of the, <laughs> of the um, how do you call that, of the scalar product of the vector. It's impossible to do, okay? Because the, di the, di the distribution, I mean, the, uh, the steps that I do, the direction in which I do the steps are not equiprobable. Now I have to, some, some places are forbidden to me, okay? So this is why, so now it means that I will have to go further away to avoid the presence of the red lines that I've drawn on the, on the ground, you see? So this is why I have a larger value for the gyration reduce. And here also, the variation of the gyration reduce with the polymer molecular weight is uh, more rapid, is more important, okay? So this is what something that uh, uh, Dejean did. He found out this uh, story with uh, and uh, Flory also did some calculation uh, for this. Flory was able to find out this uh, uh, exponent value, okay? 
So now you see when you put the polymer in the solution, this is very important, you make an object which is a sphere. Okay, and you make this sphere, and this sphere is filled with solvents, and you have an object with a given size. For example, you see, for a polymer of molecular weight 100,000 grams per mole, you have a size of about uh, 10 nanometer here. Okay? So this is an object that has a given size, and it is a mixed uh, system. It is a, a, a small... Uh, a small sphere. Of course, this is not uh, something that is completely fixed, where the molecule does not move. The molecule is always exploring some different conformation. But on average, if you integrate over the time, if you took some picture of the sample, for example, imagine, unfortunately, we, <laughs> we cannot do that, but imagine that you have a, a, a very nice microscope that allows you to uh, visualize uh, this, mole this molecule. So if you add this uh, apparatus, you make some uh, photographs of this. Click, 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 and you take one billion of photographs. Okay? So you will see many, many different conformations. So in some cases, the chain will go out of the gyration sphere and so on. But if you look at all the pictures, maybe o over one billion pictures, maybe 900 millions of these pictures be in situation where you will have the, the, uh, mo the polymer inside the, the, the gyration radius, in inside the gyration sphere. Okay? So it means that the description, it is reasonable to think that the molecule is comprised into this, this small cage of solvent in which it is, it is always uh, present. Okay? Of course, okay, so now what happens if you take that type of uh, polymer coil? So this is here, this is some experiments that were done with polystyrene into cyclohexane, okay? Polystyrene into cyclohexane, where you have the polymer chains, okay, and they were able to measure the evolution of the gyration radius as a function of the solvent condition, okay? So it means as a function of temperature, okay? So remember, polystyrene in cyclohexane, this is a typical apolar solvent. So remember what I told you, I told you in that type of system, we are in good solvent conditions at high temperature because chi is inversely proportional to T. So you have to increase the temperature to have a small chi and to have a good solvent condition. Okay? So at high temperature, we are in good solvent conditions and they have measured the gyration, the gyration radius of the, of the sphere, of the polymer chain. And what they find out is they find, for example, uh, this is a polymer of mass 2.6 times 10 to the power 7. So that's, do you remember, this is 26 millions of grams per mole. So this is a very big chain, okay? And for this very big chain, they find out that the gyration radius is 150 nanometers, okay? 1,500 angstroms, okay? Like this. And you see, when they decrease the temperature, so it's stable, and then it suddenly decreases. What's happening here? What's happening is that we are going from good solvent condition to bad solvent condition. Because when I decrease the temperature, I increase the flory parameter. Okay? So here, chi is smaller than one half, but when I decrease the temperature, chi is increasing, then it reaches one half here. And when it goes over one half, the, the, the monomers become attractive one to another and the, and the coil is collapsing. Okay? You see? And we can make a small calculation just to give you an idea of what is... If I just take... I could do that very easily. I just attribute... Yes, please. Sorry. 
Okay, I'll, I'll do that here. This is very easy. I will just, I just want to know, for example, so, okay, this is my polymer chain, and this is the sphere of gyration RG. Okay, what is? <laughs> the sphere of gyration, there is no B in the... <laughs> Okay, so every single monomer has a given volume A cube, okay, and I have N monomer. Since I know the molecular weight of the chain, I can know the number of monomers. So in that case, it's N is equal to 2.6 times 10 to the power 7 divided by the molecular weight of one monomer, okay? Uh, styrene is, uh, what is styrene? It's, uh, mm, let's see. Styrene is one, six, seven, eight carbon atom, okay? Eight carbon atom, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hydrogen atom, okay? So it's eight times 12 plus seven. So, uh, if I do, 96, 103, or I think, yeah, it's something. Okay, let's, let's average that to 100, okay? We don't need to be very precise, okay? 100, approximately. So we have this, okay? N is approximately equal to 2.6 times 10 to the power 6 monomer per chain. Uh, 4, no, sorry, seven, 5. 10 to the power 5 monomer per chain. I'm very sorry for these people, for the other people, because I, I'm not sure you see much of it, but okay. I just divided 2.6 times 10 to the power 7 to by 100, which is a number of uh, gram per mole of styrene. And I have something, it is 2.6, 10 to the power 7, to the power 5 monomer. So here I have 200,000 monomer inside this, this space. I know the volume of the sphere, which is 4 third times pi, pi times Rg to the power 3. This is the volume of the sphere. And I can calculate the proportion of the space inside the coil that is occupied by the monomer, okay? What I do is ju I just multiply that by the volume of one monomer, okay? And I can get a number, okay? Because I can have an idea of the volume occupied by one styrene molecule, okay? This is some, some tens of angstrom cube, okay? If I do that, if you do that, you realize that this object, or we can go back to the board, please. Okay, you, if you do that, you just realize that this object here is in fact comprised of about 97% of solvent. Okay, there is the volume here. The volume of the sphere of duration is, is made of 97 or 98% of solvent, and maybe 2% of the volume is occupied by the polymer chain. So it means that this is mainly solvent, okay? Mainly solvent. And this is why you cannot see polymer chains with a microscope, because there are not enough uh, optical index difference between the two, the two uh, parts of the sample. And even though here, for example, you have uh, 150 nanomet uh, nanometers, so it means that you are 0.15 microns. 0.15 microns, you, you could see something with a microscope. But because uh, a good microscope, you can go down to 0.1 microns, something like that. So you should see something with a microscope, but in fact you don't because here you don't have enough optical index difference. Okay, that's another problem. Uh, what I, what my, my, my point is that this object is made of one molecule and it is completely filled with solvents, okay? So you have to remember that. This is 
just as if you had a sphere that mainly contains solvent, and inside you have a small proportion of the space that is occupied by the polymer chain. Okay? So, let's carry on. So now I want to understand why a polymer chain, why the polymer solutions are so viscous. Okay? So I will make an experiment just on the board. Of course, this is not a real experiment, but I will describe an experiment that we can do with a polymer. Okay, so we know that if we are at a value of the flow rate parameter, sorry, at the, of the flow rate parameter which is less than one half, we know that we are in a good solvent condition, and we know that in such situation, uh, the solvent and the polymer are fully miscible one with another. There is no phase separation. Okay, so I, I take this situation. I examine the situation where the polymer is in good solvent. Okay, what happens is that if I put a little bit of polymer inside the solvent, I have some situation like that, and you see that the if you have very few polymer chains you are in a situation where you have a long distance, I mean, you have a large distance between the coils, okay? So most of the space is filled with polymer chain, with uh, solvent, okay? And you have a few polymer chains here, okay? But if you keep on adding some polymer chains into the sample, of course, if you had more and more polymer chains, you decrease the average distance between the coils, okay? And at some point, what happened? What will happen if you increase, keep on increasing the number of coils per unit volume? You will end up with a volume that will be completely filled with polymer coils, okay? There will no, there is no, now there is no space left, okay? But, of course, as I told you, here these objects here are almost filled with solvent, are filled with solvent. So you can keep on adding some molecules. And you can see that you have a, a, a kind of transition in the system where you have a situation where you have very few molecules, then you start to fill the space with the molecules. And when the whole space is filled with the molecule, if you keep on adding some molecule, you will, you will make something like that. You see this kind of, of thing here? It is a kind of uh, a net, okay, where all the coils are entangled. We call that the entangled regime, okay? So it means that the, uh, there is the, the average distance between the center of mass of the polymer coil is, is, uh, is much uh, smaller than the, the radius of duration, okay? And in that case, we have a complete uh, difference of behavior. And what, what, how do, do we, uh, how do we, um, How can we know about this change of uh, situation? And there is a very easy experiment to do. A very easy experiment to do is to uh, measure the viscosity of the solution as a function of the concentration. Okay? If you measure the viscosity of the solvent of the of the solution as a function of the concentration, what happens? When, so here it's, it's a log log scale, okay, log log scale, and here you have the viscosity of the polymer solution divided by the viscosity of the solvent of the pure solvent, okay. So at first, when you have very few coils, the viscosity of the polymer solution is very close to the viscosity of the solvent, okay? This is logical. You just have the, the, when you flow the solution, okay, the coils are moving one to another, but this is dominated by the solvent, okay? You see, 
When you increase the number of coil, if you increase the concentration of polymer, blah, 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 blah you go like this. And, okay, it's increasing a little bit, but you have no dramatic change. And what happened is when you pass this point where all the coils are untangled, okay, and they start to untangle, they start to penetrate each other, what happened is that you see that very suddenly you have a strong increase in the viscosity of the system. Okay? And this is a characteristic of polymer solution. You have a strong increase in the viscosity of the system, and this is why polymers are used for, because you can, uh, you can uh, by varying the concentration, okay, you can really play with, with, with the viscosity. Okay? And what you see here, wh why, why do we have such an increase in viscosity? If, you go back to the, if we go back to the slide before, what we see here is that when we are over this concentration here, we have uh, uh, all the coils are completely entangled. And when you flow the system, if you take a bottle of a, of a polymer into this regime here, okay, what happens is when you flow it, you have the polymer chains, they want to circulate one, one with respect to another, so they do like this, and at some point, you will have some nodes like this, you will have some entanglements. And because you flow the system, the molecules, they want to move one with respect to another, so they will have to just disentangle, okay? So, dynamically speaking, and when we talk about viscosity, we talk about the uh, dynamic property of the polymer solution. Dynamically speaking, it means that the, it will take some time for the solution to flow, some more time. And this is what you see when you take a polymer solution. It's very easy. You go to your lab, you put some into your solvent, and you will see that if you increase the concentration too much, what happens is the solution will, will, have, will become very, very viscous, okay, and will, will have a difficulty to flow. And this is exactly what tells this picture. We have an increase in the viscosity. So just on the sa for the sake of uh, formalism, we call this regime the dilute regime. We call this regime the semi-dilute or diluted regime, okay, here, or the entangled regime, we call that also. And this concentration is called the, uh, how is it called? We call it C-star, <laughs> C-star. Okay, and it's called the, um, uh, how do you call that? Concentration critique de recouvrement. It's a critical concentration of, uh, uh, well, not really saturation, critical entangle, entanglement concentration, okay? And you, it's, most of the time, it's called C star, okay? Okay, so, and I want to, what I want to show is that this C star, of course, depends on the amount of polymer that you've put in the sample, of course, but it also depends on the size of the coil, okay? If you have large coil, you can think, okay, if I have a large coil, I will not need to put many, many coils in the system because it takes a lot of space, okay? So I just want to end up with a very small, if I have, mm, uh, if it's possible to, to have another <laughs> piece of paper, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and uh, I want just want to end up with a small calculation just before uh, the end of this session. Okay, if you. <laughs> I just want to end up with a small calculation of this concentration, okay? 
we can we can have a very rough idea of this concentration. Okay. Uh, if you take the the picture of uh, again the picture of uh, of a bag, so my recipient is a bag, okay, and every coil has the same size, okay, and it's just like a ball of radius R G, okay. Do you know what is the maximal amount if you if you have a bag like this if you put some uh, some balls inside? Do you know what is the percentage of the space that I, I can occupy with the balls? Maximal. The capacity, the maximal capacity of a crystal of identical spheres is 74%. Okay? I know that I can, if I make a recipient with some balls inside, and I said all the balls have the same size here, okay, I can occupy about... 74% of the volume because you have some spare volumes here, okay? So these are, this, what I put at the black here is the 26% uh, that are not occupied with it, okay? So I said, okay, the concentration of polymer that I have to put to reach this critical concentration is I need to put enough coil to occupy 74% of the space, okay? So I need to put a number n star of chains which do have a volume of a sphere of radio, ra uh, gyration radius Rg, okay? This times that needs to be to represent 74% of the total volume. Okay? So the concentration of sphere of molecule that I have to put per unit volume is equal to uh, 74 times divided by here P R G cube. Okay. Right? So now this is the unit here is a number of molecule per unit volume. This is not very convenient. The best thing would be to put it number of gram, for example, a weight per unit volume. So if I want to go from a number of molecules to a number of uh, mass per unit volume, I just need to divide by the Avogadro number and multiply by the molecular weight. Okay? And this will give me Okay, so I can have an expression for what I call C star. C star is the critical concentration of polymer that I need to have in the system in order to get this situation transition between the dilute and the semi-dilute regime. Okay, and I can now wonder how does C star vary with the molecular weight of the chain. I will finish with that, okay? How does this vary with? Okay, of course, you, are, you have here the molecular weight, but be careful, the molecular weight is also inside Rg, because Rg is a function of the molecular weight, okay? Here, I told you we are in good solvent condition, okay? In good solvent condition, we know that Rg is proportional, is a constant, times the molecular weight at a power of 0.6, that means 3 divided by 5, okay? So I can just here write something like that, 
C star is equal to 0 0.74 divided by 4 third pi n a divided by 1 over the proportionality constant between rg and m to the power 3, 3 divided by 5 okay times m 3 divided by 5 which is the same thing as 0.6 okay so if i do like that and also i forgot that sorry mw here okay so if i do like that I just put all the constant together. So this is a constant that does not depend on the molecular weight. Okay, so I can put it with the other. And I can end up with something which is a big constant with C, uh, C star, alpha. Alpha is a constant that contains all these terms here, times MW and then I can calculate the power. It is, you have NW to the power 1 above divided by MW to the power 9 div divided by 5. So when I do the calculation, I find out that here I have minus 4 divided by 5. Okay? So it means that this concentration is getting smaller if I increase the molecular weight of the polymer. So this is very important for the people who work with polymer and solution when they want to make a product because if they want to play with the viscosity of the system, for example, for example, you see here, this is something that I obtain with 30,000 grams per mole. This is the molecular weight of the polymer. For example, if I multiply this molecular weight by 10, if I go to 300,000 grams per mole, I know that the concentration will be smaller, and I know that the concentration will be smaller by a factor of 10 to the power minus 4 divided by 5. So the concentration will be somewhere here, like for example. So it means that the transition from the dilute to the semi-dilute state will be at lower concentration here. So the viscosity with a, a polymer that has a larger molecular weight will start to increase sooner here. Okay? So, for example, it means that I will have a curve like this. So, it means that for a given polymer concentration, I will have very, very different viscosity value just by changing not the concentration, but the polymer molecular weight. Okay? So, this is a very important point. It means that the... Uh, it means that the, uh, the viscosity is a very, very critical function of the polymer molecular weight. Okay? Okay, I will finish with that. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> of, course, uh, of course, we can... Uh, if you have questions, we can discuss. I don't know if you have... Uh, do you have any question? No? Maybe in uh, in the other uh, sites. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Has anyone a question on the other sites? No. <laughs> no. They smile because they're happy that the tutorial is. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? No. Nobody. Well. Okay, so thank you very much and see you tomorrow. <laughs>